and live. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. We'll give everyone a second to, to get settled. Really excited to be here. Good evening. Welcome or welcome back, of course, to the Laurier Milton Lecture Series with the Milton Public Library. This is our first lecture back in 2021. And I hope that you've all had some time over this holiday season to rest and relax, focus on some positives. I'm so glad that we're back here together. And as always, I hope you're comfortable. I hope you have a snack or a beverage or both. And uh, for this lecture, especially a pen and a paper or a virtual notepad or Word document might be useful. We do have time carved out for questions this evening. I know that it's been a favorite part of these lectures. There is an ask a question button that you can click on on the bottom right to submit. This lecture is being recorded and will be shared in a couple of days. My name is Carolyn Hawthorne and I work for Wilfrid Laurier University. I am so proud of this partnership with the Milton Public Library. The Laurier Milton Lecture Series provides a wonderful opportunity to engage in public dialogue with the citizens of Milton and beyond in this virtual world on a broad array of important topics. Presentations represent the current research and analysis from different faculties, departments, and programs at Laurier. We'll be back again on February the 10th with Barrington Walker, Associate Vice President, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and Professor in the Department of History. His lecture topic is From a Property Right to Citizenship Rights, Historicizing the Black Experience in Canada. Before we begin the program tonight, we would like to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are located on the Haldeman Track, traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples and symbolize the agreement to share and protect our resources and not to engage in conflict. The treaty was signed by the British with their allies, the Six Nations, after the American Revolution. Despite being the largest reserve demographically in Canada, those nations now reside on less than 5% of this original territory after losing much of the territory to settlement of newcomers. But perhaps you're joining us from a different location. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the land where you reside. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as, as the traditional stewards of the land and water. This evening, I am so excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Abby Goodrum, who will be sharing insights on how to design a better world, one experience at a time. Abby holds a bachelor's degree in radio, TV, and film, and a master's and PhD in informational science. Prior to her appointment at Laurier, Abby held the Rogers Research Chair in News, Media, and Technology at Ryerson University. She also held faculty positions at Syracuse, Drexel, and Drexel Universities, where she taught user-centered design, usability, UX, knowledge management, information architecture, and digital reference. Abby also spent time working as a researcher at CNN and in educational technology for IBM. For more than 20 years, Abby's research has focused on the study of how humans seek, use, share, manipulate, store, retrieve, and organize digital multimedia. She was a founding director for social, for social science research in the 23 million Canadian Center of Excellence that serve both our research network and commercialization engine in order to address complex issues in digital media and transform multidisciplinary research into user-centered centered solutions. Yes, we are in fabulous hands this evening. Abby, welcome, and I will turn it over to you for this evening. Th thank you, gosh, it sounds a lot more impressive than it is. <laughs> I, um, I want to thank everybody who's logged on tonight. Um, I know that there are always competing uh, things that you could be doing with your time. And I'm grateful that uh, you decided to spend at least a little bit of your time tonight um, with me talking about how to uh, how we can design a better world. Um, so I am the uh, the program coordinator for user experience design at Laurier. I've most of my research, it's really, it's well over 20 years now. It's almost, oh my goodness, it's almost 30 years worth of my, of my career has been spent trying to understand 
you know, how do people how do people interact with their computers and with technology and with information in a lot of different environments? So um, as I as I kind of wind down in my uh, in my career, I, I look back and I think, wow, you know, there's there's still a lot that we don't know, um, but there's also a lot that we have discovered, and there are exciting things coming. So I want to talk about a little bit of that t tonight. And if you don't know what user experience design is, do not worry. Don't worry about it because what I'm going to talk about tonight touches on experiences that every single one of you has had, I have no doubt. Um, so let's just dig right on in. We'll start with that. I'm going to share my screen and let's, let's run. All right. So first of all, design in the world one experience at a time. Have you ever... <laughs> been in a situation where you're driving and you run out of windshield wiper fluid. This always happens to me on the 401 at midnight <laughs> uh, on a dark and stormy night where it's blizzarding and there's 18 wheelers zooming past me on the on the highway. Um, and that's always when I run out of windshield wiper fluid. And I'll say that that uh, the experience then for me has been um, that I have to pull over on the on the shoulder. Uh, things are moving by me really quickly in the dark. It's very scary. And if you're like me, you have to get out of the car and then you have to hoist up that very heavy uh, bonnet, the 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 lid, the lid, the hood of your car. You have to hoist that up. You have to fish around and find that arm that goes to support it, that metal rod. Um, and then you, uh, if you're like me as well, you're probably doing all this holding your cell phone, you know, in your teeth because you need a light. Because I have a an older model car that doesn't have a light built underneath the lid um, of the hood. So then I've got to go back to my trunk and I open that up and that's where I've got generally a couple of half empty or quarter filled uh, bottles, big bottles, right, of windshield wiper fluid. And I have to get one of those and, and open it. Now, if I'm lucky and it's a new bottle of windshield wiper fluid, then what do I have to do? I have to get my keys out or something sharp, you know, so I can break that seal on the on the on the lid and open that. And then, you know, I come around to the car, to the front of the car, and I, I open up the place where the windshield wiper fluid goes. And then what happens? Many of you have had this experience. I know it. If we were live tonight, you could shout it out. You pour it into the car and it goes everywhere absolutely everywhere until you can get the, the stream started well enough to start filling it. If it's a new bottle of windshield wiper fluid for my car, um, it, 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 I fill it up and then I've still got a good portion of fluid left in the bottle, which is why inevitably I have two or three half empty or three quarters empty bottles rolling around in the trunk of my car at any given time. All right, then I'm back and I, I put the, the lid back on. I'm looking at all the places where windshield wiper fluid went all over the engine. I'm worried, is this bad? Is it good? Is it gonna hurt it? But nevertheless, then I have to, I have to put that down and I get back in and it's, and it's nighttime and uh, scary and there you are. So, so let's talk about that experience for a second. Good experience, not so much. There are a lot of pain points in that experience, and I want to talk about pain points in user experience as opportunities for design interventions. Simple ways, simple things we can do, we could do, someone could do, to make this a better experience for this particular individual. So first of all, I have, as I said, an older model car. I have a Kia from about, oh goodness, it's about eight years old now. Um, so on my dashboard, there's no indicator light like there is for gasoline. There's no indicator light to let me know that maybe my windshield wiper fluid is running low. That would be super helpful if I had it. And I know that newer cars do have it. Because then, instead of having to find out in the middle of the night on the 401 in a blizzard that you're running out of windshield wiper fluid, well, then you'd know to top it up earlier in the day when you go and get your gas light. That'd be nice. Another thing that would help, super help, would be if there was some 
maybe um, an automatic uh, uh, way of raising my my hood on my car because really, you know, even though I'm I'm fairly strong, it's often very awkward and hard. And 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 I know I'm not alone in that to get that hood up. So if we had a hydraulic lift on the hood, that would be a good thing. Another thing that would be nice. What if we had a light that automatically turned on under the hood? Now, newer models of cars do have that, but mine does not. So there I am holding my cell phone for the light. What about the bottle itself with the windshield wiper fluid comes in? It's quite large. It's more than I need, but it's probably adequate for larger cars. But it's super hard to get that, that uh, cap off. And worse yet, it's super hard to pour. What if built into every bottle of windshield wiper fluid, there was a collapsible spigot? Or what if in built into every car, there was a reticulated and collapsible funnel that popped out of the reservoir for your fluid? Either one of those would be great. Even if I had something that I could uh, keep in the car at all times and fit in a spigot, that would, or a funnel, I guess I could always carry a funnel. So those would be nice things. But now let's think a crazy, crazy, crazy thought. What if the receptacle, the, the place to fill my windshield wiper fluid tank was inside the car instead of outside? What if it was in that rest between, between seats? Or what if it was in my glove box? Any one of these solutions could be super useful. And as we think about... Um, about user experience design and designing uh, opportunities to make the world a better place. We can look at the, the largest level, so where we're trying to completely redesign the car, to simple things like designing reticulated uh, funnels and spigots. Okay, how about this one? You walk into a door, <laughs> you're pushing it and it's a pull, or you're pulling it and it's a push. I just want to say that um, if a door has to tell you that it's a push or a pull, if it has to have a sign to tell you that, it wasn't designed very well. And we actually have a word for this, a term for this, in user experience design. We call these Norman doors um, after Donald Norman, who uh, is one of the sort of the grandfathers fathers of the field. All right, another example. Your call is important to us. Oh, really? Is it really important to you? I don't know about the rest of you out there watching tonight, but I just love it, love it, uh, when I'm trying to get through to an actual human customer service representative on the phone. Um, and what's even more frustrating is when I'm pushing all the buttons the way they told me to do, and I get sent to some kind of endless loop hell. Uh, or I get put on hold and with no feedback that anything is ever happening, that I'm getting any closer to, uh, to a solution or to getting through to a human being, or absolutely the worst, uh, when the whole thing just hangs up on me. And how many of you are feeling like this right now? Maybe you had six hours of Zoom meetings today. Um, <laughs> maybe you were trying to get something accomplished on the web today. Um, maybe you needed some information. Maybe you went to a website, a government website perhaps, where you knew that information was supposed to reside, but you couldn't find it. Um, endless, endless amounts of time spent online causes eye strain and neck fatigue. Um, wrist strain, repetitive stress injuries, um, and not to mention the frustration and fun, the pain that you felt um, trying to find information, trying to accomplish your tasks and goals with websites or apps um, that are not intuitive, or they're slow, um, or they're confusing, or they're all of the above. Well, guess what? It's not you. It's not you. It's not your fault. We tend to blame ourselves first. Oh, I'm just too stupid. I'm just too old. I just don't understand this. It's me. I don't understand how this works. It, I can't figure it out. Well, guess what? It's not you. If you've been flummoxed or frustrated or fed up with any of those experiences, take heart, friends. It's not you. Bad design is absolutely everywhere. And the problem is that oftentimes the people who build websites or software or products or services or even spaces, um, they're not designing for you. 
um, they're out looking at the problem, you know, from your perspective. Um, that creates problems uh, and frustrations for you, um, the users, um, the people who need to use the products and the services and the spaces. Um, and mostly those bad designs are just annoying or frustrating or time consuming. Uh, but sometimes bad design is in fact fatal. Um, so in 2015, for example, uh, there was a Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 that broke apart in flight um, and it killed one test pilot and it seriously injured another just because the co-pilot pulled a lever at the wrong time. Now, some of us would say that that's user error. And the NTSB investigation found that no one had paid attention in the design to what we call human factors. So that's sort of user experience design from an industrial design perspective. So in the training, in the design or function of the controls, in crew procedures, in the ergonomics, um, even in the checklist for safety equipment, it wasn't the fault of the crew member for pulling the lever at the wrong time, but it was a design failure that required um, the pilots to monitor more closely some manual procedures that hadn't been, they hadn't been trained on and that weren't immediately apparent um, in the design of the, um, of the dashboard. Um, and it became dangerous, in fact, fatal. This is not the only um, example of tragic design uh, from the aviation industry. Um, we have many more, and in fact, it has been um, uh, put, uh, discussed that the, the failure of um, the Boeing 737 uh, was also a design failure. Now, in the healthcare field, we also have a number of fatal and very tragic uh, design examples. Um, I'm going to use, uh, this is an example that um, has been around for a while, and we typically call this uh, Jenny's example, so uh, I'll use that. Um, Jenny was a little girl who previously had been in the hospital ward for cancer for four years, and she was discharged. But then a while later, she relapsed, and she had to be given a really strong chemo treatment medicine. The medicine is so strong, and it's so toxic, especially for someone of Jenny's age, that it requires pre-hydration and post-hydration for three days with IV fluids. However, after the medication was administered, three nurses who were attending to the charting software, which was new, um, they had to enter in every Thing required of them and they had to make the appropriate orders and they missed a, a critical piece of information. So Jenny was supposed to be given three days of IV hydration, but the three nurses who among them had over 10 years of experience, they were too distracted and taken up in trying to figure out the software that they were using. They actually could not understand the software um, that they were using. And as a result, they completely missed it and Jenny died. So the challenge is not only to design systems and software and products that don't annoy us, the challenge is also to design user experiences, whether it's with systems or products or software, um, that won't kill us. Um, and that's pretty important, I think. Um, Yes, it's true. We want to design systems and software and products and spaces that are adaptable to people with different skills and uh, and uh, and different um, uh, demographics. Uh, we want to design systems that are um, easy to use, right, and aesthetically pleasing, and that don't annoy us. <laughs> um, but we also want to make sure that we do no harm with our designs. And in order to do that, we have to take a user-centered design approach to what we do. We have to design for humans and not just design out of our own heads or design out of some requirement specification that was given to us. Dale Carnegie said uh, in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, he had a little story that I think illustrates um, this very well. Um, he said, personally, I'm very fond of strawberries and cream, but I've found that 
some strange reason, for some strange reason, uh, fish prefer worms. Um, so when I went fishing, I didn't think about what I wanted, strawberries and cream. I thought about what the fish wanted. And so instead of baiting my hook with strawberries and cream, I dangled a worm or a grasshopper in front of them. Now, wouldn't we all like to have that kind of consideration? Well, that's where user experience design comes in. So UX design, as we call it, is a set of tools and principles and processes that really enable designers to make sure that they're creating solutions from the user's perspective from the very beginning, from the get-go. The field has developed over several decades. Um, it draws heavily, as you can imagine, from things like psychology and cognitive science and sociology, um, more specifically um, from ergonomics and industrial design, if we're designing three-dimensional or uh, products, uh, from information architecture, which big shout out to the Milton Public Library. Um, information architecture arose directly from the work of library and information scientists over many decades. Um, it also draws from human computer interaction and the studies of how humans communicate with computers. Um, behavioral economics, all of these uh, create um, have created tools and techniques and processes that we use in trying to um, understand um, how uh, what the human condition is, what humans need, what their tasks and goals and needs are, and then to design solutions that fit specifically with them and to test to ensure that um, their needs are being met. We fall back on what we call the double diamond model. Um, uh, this is from systems design. The British Design Council actually uh, came up with this following a long study. Um, and that study involved uh, giants such as Microsoft and Starbucks and Lego. The double diamond design model has four stages. And you can see that they're, they're broken into sort of two big diamonds. The first, the formative stage, is making sure that we're designing the right thing. And that's where we focus on um, uh, making sure that we're really understanding users and their perspective um, and what their real needs are. Um, and then we trans, we move in, we, 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 we transition into uh, developing, creating prototypes and designing the right thing, uh, right, sorry, designing things right. And we do that through lots of iterative testing and prototyping. Let me explain. We begin with empathy always, um, and we start with a user-centered focus. The ability to understand the people we're designing for, um, and even to work alongside of them in co-design rather than me telling you as a designer what you need to have, you and I could work together in dialogue um, to create the thing that works for you best. Um, this empathy, development of empathy is a, it's a, an essential part of UX design. Without this, there is no UX design. And you can't just rely on things like web analytics or marketing data to tell you about your users. So how do you do this? Um, you can ask users what they think, what they feel, what they need. Um, and we do. We survey. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get a little drink here. Tea. Um, you can ask them, and we do. We survey, we interview, we have focus groups. But here's the thing. Margaret Mead said that what people say, what people do, and what people say they do are all quite different things. And I find that's, uh, that's generally true. If you were to ask me right now uh, about my, my diet or my exercise regime, I would tell you a very good story about how frequently I, uh, I'm uh, doing my workout in the basement and about how I'm counting all of my calories and my macros. But the reality is uh, that, um, in actuality, my behavior betrays me. <laughs> so, so I'm not alone in that. You've probably experienced that too. 
So what we also like to do in, in UX design is watch people. We like to observe them. We like to observe their behaviors. And we sometimes we do this in the lab when, when our labs are open, but we also do it in the wild, kind of like Jane Goodall going out into the field and observing uh, the chimpanzees. And what we do is we call this ethnography. Um, and I wanna give you a quick example. There's a reason why there's a no parking sign on your screen right now. Um, Dr. Ellen Isaacs, who's a researcher uh, with Xerox Park, um, they were funded uh, to design some solutions uh, around the problem of parking in New York City. Anyone who's tried to park in Toronto, you'll have uh, had seri uh, similar experiences, I'm sure. Um, if they ask people what's the problem with parking in New York City, they would be told, they were told that there weren't enough parking places or that they're, uh, that loading um, uh, trucks were, you know, blocking parking during much of the time that you wanted to, to park. Um, which is true. It is true that there aren't enough and that loading loading and unloading as well as stopping and standing and uh, let, places for letting people on and off um, compete for parking. Um, but Xerox Park and the researchers, including Ellen I Dr. Isaacs, went and they spent uh, oh, they have over a thousand hours of video <laughs> spent watching people park uh, badly in many cases uh, and driving around with lorry drivers and driving around with taxi drivers and driving around with ordinary people and watching them try to find parking. And one of the things that they found was that um, it wasn't so, well, obviously there's not enough parking, but this is exacerbated by the fact that most parking signs tell you what you can't do and they don't tell it to you in any organized fashion. And so as you're driving by at whatever, 40 you know, kilometers an hour or even 30 kilometers an hour, you're trying to make a decision in the split of, uh, of a second uh, as you see a parking sign that tells you whether you can park here now. So I, I'll, uh, I'll ask this the same way that Ellen Isaacs does. Looking at this sign, if it's, if it's four o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday, can you park here now? And the answer is we don't really know. Um, a lot depends on what you know, uh, what day it is, and um, uh, it, we know that we can't, or that we can't park from eight to noon, which would infer that we can park uh, there at four on both sides of the street except for holidays, which holidays, we don't know. Um, so there are any number of challenges. So as a first pass at trying to design solutions after they had, as I said, over a thousand hours of video and, and photos and interviews and surveys, um, they thought that they might begin by making um, street signs a little bit easier to understand. So first of all, organizing it uh, chronologically on the sign from earliest uh, part of the day until uh, uh, the latest part of the days, um, and then um, uh, telling you what you can and can't do at each one of those, red for something you can't do, green for something you can. So you could automatically go to the green. Um, they also later then uh, also created an automated parking meter uh, that could be controlled by GPS, by lorries, delivery trucks that could then take up freight and service spaces when it was needed and then release those spaces later on and then uh, when they weren't being used so that other people could park. Okay, so in doing that, in mapping out all of the data that they had from, from uh, users, interviews, focus groups, surveys, observations, user experience designers generate a lot, a lot of data. And one of the tools that we use to help uh, analyze the data and to quickly identify opportunities for design interventions is called um, an experience map, a user experience map, or sometimes a customer experience map. This is just a sample. It's very hard to read. You probably, uh, the font is too small, I apologize. Uh, but this is uh, the experience of getting a ticket uh, for uh, rail, uh, through Rail Europe. Um, and you can see, I hope if my, if my mouse will work here, um, that they've broken the journey down into sort of a pre-planning stage before you've bought, um, oops, a shopping stage. Um, oops, I have to go back. Um, 
uh, where you're actually thinking, you know, where you're actually purchasing a ticket, the booking of the ticket, uh, the post booking, but pre travel, the travel stage and then a post travel and through this they've mapped high points and low points pain points and peak experiences where we see pain points those are opportunities to design an intervention that will make people's lives better where we see peak experiences those are opportunities for us to take what's working and amplify them or borrow you know well what is it that we're doing right here that really uh, made a difference to users Okay, so once we've conducted a lot of that formative user research and we truly understand our users, their perspectives, their pain points, their peak experiences, then we begin brainstorming solutions. We do this in teams, we wanna get more ideas, um, but I just wanna say this, um, this ideation phase, uh, a lot of people get stuck in this and they think that this is all that design thinking really is about. Um, the hard part I find with innovation isn't coming up with lots and lots of great ideas. The hard part is finding the right idea to pursue. So we don't just ideate in a vacuum, in a void. We always come up and brainstorm and ideate uh, based on solid research and experience. Um, and then we try to narrow that down to one, two, maybe three ideas that we're going to move forward and prototype. So the, the prototype phase is an iterative phase and it's, it's build a little, test a little, build a little, test a little. I like to call this cheap and cheerful. It's low risk uh, development of solutions in ways that don't cost you a fortune um, and help you to ward off problems before they become big, ugly, expensive problems. You can do this on paper. You can do it in cardboard if you're mocking up um, uh, 3D you know, products. You can do it 3D printers if you're doing products. I even had one group of students who had a client who needed some um, community space designed in a, in a public, uh, like a shopping mall. Um, and the students decided to do their low fidelity prototype uh, using the popular uh, game Minecraft. They did this not just because it was fun for them, which I'm sure had a part to play, but also because doing that enabled them to create an actual 3D space that people could wander around in uh, with multiple people engaging in that space, interacting in that space at the same time. And that enabled them to see what the flow of traffic would be like, where people got bunched up, where people got confused, where's the bathrooms, that sort of thing. It really enabled them to look at interactions in that space and to design ways to, again, highlight and amplify peak experience, peak interactions in that space, while at the same time designing away the pain points. So an important aspect of UX design, um, it's, um, it's crucial to having uh, uh, a, an understanding, uh, is, is to understand the various ways that human beings interact uh, with each other, uh, with their environments, with technologies, with products, um, and to make sure that we're designing to support the kinds of interactions that people expect, they have mental models for, but also the kinds of interactions that will be most likely to support the task that they're trying to achieve. And we have such a wealth of, of ways that we can do that today, right? You can interact with uh, technology using a keypad or a mouse, um, a touch screen, uh, your voice, and you can even use gesture um, and even brainwaves. I've played with some great technology where I was able to control the technology with my thoughts. So in order to design a better world, uh, what we want to do is make sure that we're able to support the user's full range, full range of abilities. Their cognitive, their physical, their visual, their auditory requirements. We want to make sure that what we design works for people and the abilities that they have. Another kind of interaction that we see taking place increasingly today is between humans and artificial intelligence. Many of you 
have probably um, already interacted with a chat bot, uh, help assistant on a website perhaps, or maybe you've talked to Siri or Alexa and asked uh, them to answer a question. So as we move into this realm, we have to think about how do we design AI systems and the interactions that we have with robots? And what do we know about those interactions already? And what, do we, what can we take from human to human interaction or human to computer uh, interactions and translate into human robot interactions? Again, always in ways that support the human in that. Um, in order to do that, we need to have an understanding of some of the unique ethical considerations um, that, that come about when designing for this realm. And one of those is what we call computational bias. So for example, if you're building a facial recognition system and your training set of faces are all very homogeneous, let's say they're all white, they're all male, they're all over 30, then the results that you get from your facial recognition software are going to be biased towards recognizing those kinds of faces. And they're not going to do a very good job of recognizing other kinds of faces. So we need, we need to look at that. We also have to look at transparency and transparency in interactions. So for example, if I'm interacting with a robot, is my preference for that robot to self-identify as a bot. So if it's a chat bot, do I want it to say right up front, hi, my name's Fred and I'll be your bot for the day. Or do I interact better? Do I have more trust in Fred if I don't know that he's a bot? What happens if I discover he's a bot later? Then is my trust uh, destroyed? Um, so we have to think about these things. And should, should bots apologize? <laughs> when when they make a mistake, does that help us to interact? Does it make us? Uh, does it give us more trust um, in uh, in what we're doing? All right. Another challenge: multi-channel. Our technologies now are always on. They're ubiquitous. They're with us everywhere. They're geographically distributed. My Apple Watch it talks to my Fitbit app, which talks to my refrigerator, or it could. Um, I suspect that they could all talk to my grocery store. Um, and who knows who else my Internet of Things is going to reach out? Who also knows who's watching what I'm doing? So when we think about the challenges of, of user-centered design and designing a better world, we also have to think about the trade-offs in design, ease of use, ease of translating and moving between uh, devices, ease of uh, having devices do the work for us and talk to each other um, versus my loss of privacy, my loss of anonymity, my loss of control. So how can we design systems to support privacy and anonymity and control without at the same time designing systems that empower and enable criminals, for example, and their activity. Whew, let's shift gears a bit from that. Throughout that prototyping phase, as I discussed earlier, we conduct user testing. Uh, little wins and increasingly larger wins as we progress. Um, and we do this to ensure, going back to the double diamond, that we're building something that actually works the way that it was intended to work. Um, but be aware, in a lot of cases, in a lot of discourse uh, articles that you might read uh, that talk about usability testing and UX, they, they'll treat those as though they're um, uh, synonymous. Usability testing happens sort of at the end. It, it's that testing to make sure that what we designed works. Um, and it's very important. I, I, I won't say it's not, but it's not all of user experience design. Remember the earlier part of the double diamond, we wanna make sure that we actually design the right thing. And then we wanna make sure that what we designed works. So those, those go together. And if you don't bring someone in to do UX until the very end when it's just a usability test, the best you can hope for is that we can say, yeah, what you built works. 
but you may never have any clients, you may never have any customers, or the people that use it may not like it because you didn't actually design something that they needed from their perspective in the first place. And we use a number of different tools um, and processes to conduct usability tests, depending on what we're designing. For example, uh, we use eye tracking, so I can see where a user is looking on the screen, where their eyes are fixating, what things are distracting to them. We can also do other kinds of physiological tests, particularly for things that are more immersive. So we can do galvanic skin uh, testing. If you've got sweaty palms, you've got some kind of uh, uh, interest uh, or possibly um, aversion. Uh, we can look at pupil dilation. We can do uh, emotion tracking. We can actually measure whether your face uh, muscles are turned up in a smile or turned down in a frown or looking very confused. Um, we can do simple things like time on task. If I have two versions of the same uh, system and I want to improve the amount of, I want to decrease the amount of time you're using and I can, I can test for that, I can look for errors. There are a lot of things that we can do to test um, for uh, the usability to see if what you designed actually works. Okay, so I need a sip of my tea. It's just cold now, but. Mm. All right. So who's doing UX? Who's actually doing uh, all of this stuff? Well, here's a few, <laughs> but really it's everyone. There's not a sector, um, uh, there's not an industry or governmental sector uh, today in Canada and in North America and for sure that um, hasn't, um, hasn't uh, begun or isn't well into uh, trying to uh, improve the experience of their users. Um, I'm just going to use Disney as an example. Many people don't know this, um, but Disney has been engaged in understanding how people interact in their spaces and with their, um, their content um, for a really, really long time, which makes sense if you think about it. Um, I don't know if you've been to Disney in, in Florida, but you know, it's hot, uh, it's humid, there's bugs, um, there are screaming children, there are long lines, someone's, you know, spilled their ice cream cone. Uh, it, it's not, it's not my definition of the happiest place on earth. And yet, people who go there return again and again, they send their friends, they tell their, their family to go. Um, and it has been billed as the happiest place on earth. And one of the reasons for that is that for many decades, they have put in the time and the effort to understand how people move through their spaces um, and, and even more, how they move through their digital spaces prior to going uh, even even purchasing a ticket, how does somebody research their the their desire to to have this as part of their vacation, all the way up through to what happens after they return home, and they've designed pieces of that experience for the entire life cycle. If you think back to the Europe Rail uh, journey, it's a, it's a very similar kind of design approach, um, and Disney has done an excellent job. They know, for example that they cannot make lines shorter uh, for very hot rides. And so what they do is they design the experience of having to be in a very long ride in such a way that it's not so heinous. Um, you can't see the end, for example, and they distract you at every turn with delightful sounds and scents and, um, and images. Um, Ontario Digital Services, let me see where my time is. Ontario Digital Services is another um, example of someone, uh, an organization within our own government and Canadian Digital Services who are uh, investing lots of time and effort to make sure that you know all Canadians and all Ontarians are able to, um, to um, access the information and the services they need completely online if they need to access them that way. And this is a this ha this was in place on ODS and uh, CDS were in place and working on these challenges well before COVID, which is great because in many ways we were um, 
we were poised to respond to lockdowns um, in ways that weren't necessarily true in other company, uh, countries, such as Japan, who you would have thought would have had a much more um, uh, web accessible, uh, accessible uh, government uh, services, and, and yet they don't. So everyone's doing it. And why do companies invest in uh, UX? Well, because there is a return on investment. For every um, dollar invested, there is a return. A couple of examples. Jeff Bezos invested 100 times more into the customer experience than in advertising uh, during the first year. Airbnb's Mike uh, Gebbia, uh, he's in uh, public appearances, he's credited UX with taking the company to 10 billion. Um, McAfee saved 90% in expenses after they integrated usability testing uh, to learn more about their customer needs. And there are many, many more uh, examples that we could give here. So we've, we've clearly seen that uh, there's a benefit to designing uh, using a user-centered uh, perspective for companies and for the government. Um, but I think when we talk about designing a better world, we have to think of how do we how do we utilize the double diamond, these principles of developing empathy, um, doing research or even co-design uh, with uh, particular user groups. Um, and um, creating solutions and testing in an iterative fashion to make sure that what we build um, works for everyone. And I think that's the critical thing here. So we want a commitment to putting people first and designing as though people matter. Um, that's not just good for society, it's good for business as I've shown you. Um, so I think before, before I conclude, I want to give you a little example of um, one of the ways that, that we're trying at Laurier uh, to take these UX design principles um, and, um, and do a very small thing, hopefully, um, that will contribute to designing a world um, that works for everyone. So we do have, um, coming up this, uh, this semester, this spring, um, with the generous support of Scotiabank, um, we're going to be holding a four-week Canada-wide, coast-to-coast-to-coast design challenge around climate change. And this will be open for college and university students anywhere in Canada. We're going to have a kickoff announcement um, about this in two weeks. Um, so, you know, do stay tuned for that. Um, but our hope is um, not just to um, open this to students who might be studying UX design or engineering or computer science or even graphic design somewhere, but to students anywhere in Canada who want to who wanna try to work together in teams to design solutions, possibly solutions that we haven't thought of, um, uh, to changing human behavior uh, around climate change. So in the same way that I talked about, Disney can't necessarily get rid of lines, but they can change how people think about those lines and what people do in those lines. We're, we're going to be borrowing heavily from behavioral economics to see if we can design solutions that shift human behavior um, and make positive changes for our environment. So with that, I think I will um, I will thank uh, Laurier and the Milton Public Library for having me here tonight. Um, I'm sure we can um, uh, we can have a discussion. We can have lots of questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. My email's here, but I'm easy to find. As is the UX uh, program online. So just Google us, and uh, and hopefully we can stay in touch that way. Um, I think I'm going to open it for questions, and I don't know how that works exactly, but I think you post your questions in the in the ask a question area. Maria will know. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Abby. It was a great presentation. Uh, so far, we have one question, but uh, we'll get going with that. So my name is uh, Maria Patrico, and I'm the manager of branches at the Milton Public Library. And so we're ready for your questions. If you do have any and you want to to take advantage of Abby's presence here, please uh, type it into the Ask a Questions tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, at this point, 
There's one from Peter and he's asking, what is the similarity or difference of user experience design and evidence-based design? That's good. Um, I would say um, that evidence-based design um, in many cases uh, sort of does the research, creates designs based on past evidence, and that evidence could be from marketing analysis or it could be from web anal um, analytics, um, whereas user research uh, or uh, user experience design is really, um, they take, they do that as well but they also bring in more of the here and now trying to develop empathy for and with users in that moment, um, which is evidence. So I won't say that it's not, it's a kind of an evidence, it's not published evidence, um, but the two are not ex mutually exclusive. The other thing that you we might see more of in UX design that we don't always see in evidence-based design is that um, sort of the more prototyping and testing phase uh, leading into then the final usability testing phase. I hope that helps. Um, so, so far, there have not been more questions. I'm gonna give it a, a one or two more minutes, but I have something that came up for me during your presentation is um, I really enjoyed the, 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 how you're discussing the importance of the user experience. And I've read a little bit about um, how it, this pertains to city planning and mm -hmm. essentially how a sidewalk is installed and then people yep. naturally walk across the grass or go around in a different way and um, the planners are like, but we built this beautiful sidewalk. And it's sort of that need for the sense of how people engage with areas rather than what's a standard or what, what they think looks good. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there are lots of examples where in in cities or in design of uh, trailheads, things like that, um, where you can see that someone's cut across, <laughs> you know, they haven't stayed on, they didn't stay on the sidewalk, no. they cut across because it's faster. And they've got this money to... path that's been created and you just naturally have to then create a sidewalk there. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting too, um, you're a librarian and uh big kudos to libraries everywhere because they were on the forefront of user experience design long before it was called user experience design. But librarians in trying to organ to develop organizational schemes that allowed people to access materials in the ways that met their needs. Um, yes. And uh, the kinds of services that libraries provide have long been driven by actual, like people don't know this, but they were actually driven by user needs analysis. So, Absolutely. I think that um, my library colleagues. <laughs> Unfortunately, due, due to the present situation, it's not open, but Sherwood Branch was designed very much with that in mind. And, and I know future branches are, are definitely going to be in line with that type of discovery model. For, for people. Yeah. Well, and um, and the use of um, artificial intelligence um, for uh, reference uh, requests for questions hmm. uh, and question answering um, was actually used first by libraries long oh. before it was adopted by uh, by everybody else. <laughs> libraries uh, in in North America, in fact, championed this. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so. so there is another question here. Um, uh, Julie is saying that her daughter's with her and she's, uh, for anyone who's interested in taking the UX design course at Laurier, what kind of jobs could they uh, foresee to, to to have in the future with such yeah, a degree? That's great. Um, glad glad that we have an interested student and parent. Um, obviously, because I'm a, I'm a professor, I like students. So uh, I will say that the, the job opportunities are quite good in UX. It's a growing field. Um, it's also a rapidly um, evolving field. So in the past, I'd say 10 years ago, there were not degrees that were um, uh, dis that were earmarked as being UX degrees. Today, um, there are, and uh, we have one of them, as a matter of fact. Um, but in the past, you got a job, uh, Maybe you got a degree in psychology and then you went into UX research or you had a background in graphic design and then you kind of, you know, did some web design. So these things are, are evolving rapidly. And um, because every industry needs UX researchers and UX designers and UX strategists, it's uh, there's lots of jobs. So we have a co-op program, for example, in um, in our at, 
at Laurier in UX design. And um, I can tell you that I had uh, all of my co-op students, you know, going out and looking for work in January and February of last year, and they got jobs. And then everything shut down. <laughs> and some of them were told by their companies, oh, we're, we're not going to do co-op now. Oh, we don't know what's going to happen. It's all shut down. They were immediately snatched back up by other companies that wanted them. Mm -hmm. As well, one of my biggest challenges is keeping students in the program because once they do co-op, they're often offered, some of them are being offered full-time permanent positions before they've graduated. So if you do, Julie, or Julie's, if you do uh, come into UX at Laurier, please go the full four years. Mm -hmm. Good to, good to complete that degree. Oh, one other thing I should say, there are um, the UX Professionals Association, which is an international um, organization of UX designers, UX researchers, UX strategists. Um, they do a uh, biannual, every two year uh, salary survey. It's an international salary survey. Most of their membership is in North America though, so it is a bit skewed towards that. But having said that, they publish those results. They're free, they're on their website. It's uxpa.com org, I think, UX Professionals Association. And starting salaries are quite good. So um, we're looking at, you know, the 70s-ish um, without any experience right out of school. Well, Abby, we always send an email um, uh, in the next day or two once the, the lecture is available on our website. And we can add any other resources you may have as well if you'd like to send that to us. There is another, another question here um, from Daniel. He's saying, I find UX design in a software context means different things to different people. Would it make sense for a UX designer to call him or herself a more general name like software designer? Mm. Um, that's, that's true in some cases, but not in ours. And so I'll give you some context. We see UX design as being a much bigger umbrella than just the design of digital things mm. or digital experiences. Um, and really, it's all blurry because even physical analog experiences today often have a digital touch point. So you may be designing digital and analog. Um, in our program, this isn't true in all, but in our program, students, and it's a four-year degree, right? So you have we have the luxury. We're not a boot camp like a weekend UX boot camp. So we have the luxury of being able to expose students to what UX design looks like uh, for 3D, so product design. So in fact, our students have two semesters of Maker Lab. They're in there using CAD software, creating, uh, you know, using the 3D printer and uh, welding and Arduino and all kinds of, I don't teach that mm -hmm. class you can tell my limited knowledge but so actual objects we also have students take are required to take an immersive design course some of them choose to take that immersive design course with a folk and focus their work on vr so digitally immersive but the person who you know who crafted the course with us and who often teaches it for us is in fact um, uh, a, a landscape architect uh, uh, has worked in urban planning and urban design so the lessons that you learn and the, the principles that you learn about designing physical spaces to uh, accommodate, support or not, uh, you, human beings uh, can be used in, in virtual spaces, digital immersive spaces as well. Um, yeah, so we don't we don't limit uh, and we teach service design. So which is one of the reasons why uh, we've done so much work with Ontario Digital Services over the past few years. Um, they actually need not well, now they need to design it all, you know, sort of digitally, but they also care a lot about how people access their services in real world, real time, analog ways that are not just online, but that are supplemented and supported by online tools. Excellent. That was our final question. Um, <laughs> it looks like we made it right on the button for eight o'clock here, oh. if my time is right. <laughs> so on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University, the town of Milton and the Milton Public Library, thank you, Abby, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Uh, thank you also to all the attendees for joining us. And like I mentioned, a copy of tonight's lecture will be shared on the Milton Public Library website in the next few days, as well as previous lectures if you missed any. Um, if you'd like to receive these and you're not on our, our uh, list yet, please visit beinspired.ca to sign up. And uh, our next lecture will be on February 10th, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you all and have a lovely night. Thank you.
Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.